And now it is my pleasure and delight to introduce to you Lynn Green. Lynn Green is an advanced practice nurse practitioner, uh, but additionally she, is ex she has really developed a great core strength in botanical medicine and has earned a degree as a master herbalist as well. Uh, her master's degree in nursing is from George Mason University. Uh, she is currently completing a fellowship at the University of Arizona Integrative Medicine Program that was started by Dr. Andrew Weil. And Lynn's own medicinal garden is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I have heard her speak before on a number of topics, and I think that you are in uh, for a very informative presentation. And so now I'd like to introduce to you Lynn Green. Hello, Lynn. Hi, good afternoon. It, I would like to welcome everybody. It, this is my passion, is home herbal medicine making. It does not have to be difficult. So some of the things we're going to talk about today are common herbs that you can find anywhere, herbs that are very easy to grow in almost any environment, and then also utilizing basic kitchen items. It, it, it is much easier than, than people think. First weed we always think about is dandelion. We're actually not going to talk about this one today, but I just had to open up with the most ubiquitous quote unquote weed out there. Um, weeds are very, very nutritious. We're going to talk about um, plantain and then also chickweed today. And um, wild and not so wild herbs. It, two of the mantras that definitely govern my practice, let your food be your medicine by Hippocrates. And then also my favorite, um, no illness that can be treated with diet should be treated by any other means. And I am a firm believer that if we get back to the basics of nutrition and then also with herbalism, we can obtain a lot of the nutrients we need from our food. There's always a role for supplementation. And I am a nurse practitioner as well. And there's always a role for medications when needed, but it's getting the right balance of that for people. So with the basics of herbs, some of the things we look for, quality of herbs. I'm a big fan of grow your own. So you're actually going to see quite a few pictures of my yard and my kitchen um, because there's no reason people can't do this on their own. I encourage you to pick one or two a year to really get to know well um, versus being overwhelmed. I find a lot of times when people start and get overwhelmed, it's that they, they've picked too much to take on brand new. Looking at the quality of your herbs, though, it is not always possible to grow your own. So when you look at them in a store, you want to know where they were grown, where they were harvested, and how they were treated. Also, how they've been stored. Um, most dried herbs, you want to be stored out of direct sunlight. You would like them in darker containers. And then also as little oxygen as possible. And also the age of your herbs. Um, when you're looking at your local health food stores and local herbal stores, they have highly knowledgeable people who will be able to help you with this, and they can tell you everything about that herb you would ever want to know. Some basics that we can cook in our kitchen or make in our kitchen that are so easy are infusions or teas. And there are so many things you can do after you make the infusion. Also tinctures, which is putting an herb in an alcohol base. Poultices, infused oils, and salves. Um, also decoctions, and then honeys or maple syrups. I was making Monarda fistulosa, um, which is bee balm, honey, and maple syrup yesterday. There's nothing easier than going out, harvesting your own herb, cutting it up, sticking it in honey, and just monitoring it for two weeks, shaking it every day, and then you are left with a wonderful remedy at the end of that that you can take as either a teaspoon of honey or you can put it in your teas. There's so many different things you can do. Glycerin tincture for kids or for adults who prefer not to have alcohol. And then also sprays and gargles. Um, don't forget those because once you have made your infusion or your tincture or your decoction, you can always use them in various ways. The pictures that you see, um, I'm a big one for adults need show and tell also. Um, the picture to your top right is drying in my back hall. This was one of the easiest ways I have found to dry herbs. When you're drying herbs, you want them to be in a bundle ideally and then hung up where air can flow freely. You don't want a huge, large bundle. The other way I dry them is on cookie sheets, and we'll see that as well. And then as for storage of herbs, um, one of the things I learned early on from making the mistake quite frequently was label everything. And the easiest labels for me have been this blue tape. 
usually I'll put the common name, the official name of the herb, and then the date, and then also the garden it was collected from or where I wildcrafted it from. What I find great about the blue tape labels is as I'm making tinctures and other things and oils, is the blue tape label goes from the original container all the way through to the end container. Because when you're pouring up multiple things, it's very easy to get those confused. Bottom right is a potato ricer. Um, when you are making tinctures or oils, there is nothing better than being able to press out your herbs. Um, herb presses are available for people doing um, larger quantities of herbs, but they're also very expensive for home use. And so when we're talking about kitchen medicine, we talk about trying to use tools that are within your kitchen. And when you're pressing herbs, either a flour sack cloth and you can twist it to get the ending out, or potato ricers work beautifully. Just make sure potato ricers are stainless steel. I have seen some others. Now when we're talking about infusions, especially medicinal infusions, um, these typically are a little stronger than your normal tea that is just for taste. You can use fresh or dried herb. There are all kinds of different vessels for brewing. Um, and the reason I've got a picture up here showing you several different ways is because I've had people tell me, well, I don't like teas because they're just so messy. Um, we do have some tea bags medicinally that are available that do a great job and keep things corralled. But then within that picture, the, the cup on the left-hand side has those little holes at the top. So you simply fill this cup with your dried herb, and it's got a stopper in the top. I can tell you from this cup, it, um, if you've got larger herbs, it's harder to get them out and clean them. The cup in the middle, the, the white cup, is an old-fashioned cup. That cup is from the late 1800s China piece that you put your loose herbs in. And then as you drink out, uh, that bottom part has holes where your water comes through, but your herbs stay contained in your teacup. And they were doing this eons ago. Also, the cup on the right has what's called a herba mate straw in it. And you can see two of these straws down the bottom in the middle of the picture. What you do is you put in your um, herb, whatever herb it may be, fill it up with water, let it steep, and then you just simply drink through the straw. When I'm making medicinal teas, um, actually an even not medicinal teas, I keep throwing herb in there all day long, and I just keep filling it with water. It is the easiest way to make an infusion. Drink through the straw, and then at the end of the day, those straws are stainless steel. They can go in your dishwasher. Herb goes out to your compost pile, and you can't get much easier than that. I did include some tea balls on here because most people tell me, though, they don't like cleaning the tea balls, and that's why I go for other ways of making infusions for people. The cup on the right also has a strainer that sits right down in the cup, which is a very neat way to do things for people who don't like straws. When we're looking at steeping times, um, the more tannins an herb has in it, the more bitter it can get with longer steeping times. So you will also get to know as you play with different herbs what, what goes in and how long. Most steeping times are between three to 10 minutes. It, my herbs that I steep all day long though, those can sit in there a good 12 hours. With infusions, we also have hot and cold infusions. For example, lemon balm has much less tannin extraction with a cold in infusion than a hot infusion. However, we want hot infusions for certain things. For example, yarrow and breaking fevers, hot infusions do very well. Um, for hot flashes for menopausal women, um, sage infusions that are cold do very well. Infusions also can be made in larger containers and you can keep them up for three days in the refrigerator, although I find most don't last that long. However, overnight infusions, um, my favorite way of doing that is a half gallon container, handful of herb goes in it, whatever I am utilizing, and then fill the half gallon jar full of hot water. I cap it off and it steeps overnight. My favorite for those are nettles and oat straw. Those the next morning you strain off and then you can drink them throughout the day. But to keep it simple on a glass, bring your water to a boil. Let it settle. Don't pour the water over the herb when it's boiling. Pour it over the herb, one to three teaspoons per cup. And usually when I'm looking at a medicinal tea, I'm more in those three teaspoons of dried herb, more if it's fresh herb. Cover it to steep. The volatile organics within the herb, it 
they don't do you a lot of good if they're out in the air unless we're doing an inhalation, which we most certainly can do with an infusion. But cover them to steep and then strain and enjoy. Or use your Herba Mate straw or your strainer cup. But what I want to impress on you is make this simple. Everybody has their favorite way to do infusions, and you just need to find what yours is. For tinctures, we're going to talk about a home simple method. And this method, the only equipment you need is cutting board, a knife, a mason jar, or some other type of jar, a lid, and a label. For supplies, you need alcohol, whatever your menstruum is going to be in your herb. Most menstruum or most alcohol mixes, vodka works very well. Um, 80 proof vodka is 40% alcohol, and that will give you the extraction you want. Making tinctures is so simple. You simply chop up the herb, add alcohol, cover, let it steep for at least two weeks. And I like to shake mine every day and keep an eye on all of my herbal preparations that I'm making, whether it be tinctures or oils, honeys, maple syrups, they all get shaken every day. And the reason I say for at least two weeks is that's the minimum you want to do. But to be quite honest, I've had tinctures that have not been strained out for a year, and that's perfectly fine. You want to label your your tincture as soon as you make it. And this is where the green label is going from a quart mason jar or half gallon mason jar, then follow my tinctures through. This method you only want to use with safe herbs. Um, for example, I would not use this method, method with something that I'm dosing very accurately, for example, lobelia. However, for general very safe herbs, this works well. The mark is the used herb. Once you are done with your tincture and you press out your tincture, your leftover herb can go into your compost pile. And what a way to reuse your herb. The equipment that you see on the slide now, the same equipment is used for oils and for tinctures. You just use different menstruum. The three oils on the left are an olive oil, a sunflower oil, and then also a grapeseed oil. And I also use almond oils. And the Fleischmann's vodka on the right, please keep in mind, you can do any type of vodka. There are 40% vodkas and 50% vodkas. The 50% tend to be on the more expensive side. And you, it's for quality of vodkas. You can find some organic vodkas. Um, but vodka is your menstruum. Or we're in the state of Wisconsin. People here love brandy tinctures. So brandy is also another option. With your jars down the bottom, I use everything from these little teeny four ounce jars all the way up to the half gallon mason jars. Make sure you have tight fitting lids. And if you're making a tincture that is a vinegar base, you don't want to have a metal lid. You just want to use a plastic lid. My blue tape over on the right hand side, and you can't get much easier than that for labeling. These are some of my jars. And then the right-hand jar actually is a lemon balm in vodka tincture that is infusing. And then also on the top of my labels, I write what I'm dealing with. So it's lemon balm. It's Melissa Fischianalis. We're at a 40% vodka. The date that it was put in in the GW garden is for our gardens. You will find, depending on where you harvest herbs, if you're wild crafting, they will have um, different characteristics, different tastes. Sometimes if the herb is stressed more, if it's grown in a dry environment, you're going to have more of the volatile compounds in it. We're into one of my favorites in summer, poultices. Poultices are just macerated herb, which is munched up herb. Um, you can squeeze it between your fingers. You can roll it in your hands. You can use a mortar and pestle to macerate it. And then it's applied topically. The most simple method, we call it um, spit poultices. And the plantain is bottom right, and then yarrow is bottom left. And both of those make great poultices for skin. We're going to show you how to identify plantain down the road. I understand we have um, people calling in from Australia and also from Europe. It, I have found plantain on every continent I have been to. It is one of the most ubiquitous herbs that you can find in cities. You can find it in the country. I have never been to a locale yet where I have not found that, albeit Alice Springs in the middle of the desert of Australia, but you can still find it in town. Bottom left is yarrow, which is also known as staunch weed or soldier's wort, which is a fantastic herb for skin and skin structure. And um, it is another herb that's found all over the place. 
Infused oils are very easy. You take the same method we used for tinctures, and now we're going to do it in oils. Oils can be used topically for massage. Um, I use all my herbal infused oils also for making salad dressings and then basic salve recipes. So with the herbs on the infused oils, though, you do want to dry them or wilt them, especially if they're, uh, they are a high um, water content herb. I have had comfrey oil that has molded due to um, water content. And calendula, it, you want to wilt, and you'll see some pictures of that. The only herb that I put in straight from the garden into my oils is St. John's wort flowers because they're not high in water content. But again, you simply chop, fill your jar three quarters full of herb, cover it with oil, shake daily as you would a tincture, strain, press, bottle, label, compost your spent herbs. One of the things with oils is you do want to store them in a cool place, and shelf life of oils is six months. Um, shelf life of an alcohol-based tincture, though, 100 years, easy. The next slide you see is St. John's wort. I just absolutely love these flowers and wanted to show you some of the characteristics that you look for in your oils. Calendula oil will turn a bright yellow. This St. John's wort oil, though, you'll see the one on the left um, was put in at the end of June and it has turned red from the hypericum content. The one on the right was a fresh St. John's wort oil that was made. So I just wanted you to see those because this is one of the most common oils out there. But I have had people call me and say, it's turned red and they, they think it's going bad, but it's not. Also with oils is I tend to open my containers every single day to check to make sure I'm not having moisture build up and also to make sure that there is no mold. This slide is calendula that's wilting. Um, calendula, I always wilt it down before I make my oils. I tend to put whole heads in my oils or my tinctures for calendula. Some people just pull the petals off. And you'll see the jars on the right. Now, making salves is very easy. It double boiler. You need a grater for your beeswax, a flexible spatula, which most of our kitchens have. Now, supplies are oil and beeswax. Um, beeswax now comes pelletized. So if you want the ultimate easy way, just order pelletized beeswax. However, beeswax from your local farmer, excellent. Um, whatever grater you use for your beeswax, though, um, you will probably never be able to use again in your kitchen. At least I never have been able to. So it's been relegated to my staff making equipment. We can add in essential oils and vitamin E, especially for longevity of your staff. But gently heat your oil after it's been strained. Add the appropriate amount of beeswax, which is approximately one-fourth beeswax to oil. When it's melted, start testing consistency on a spoon, or I tend to test it on a um, long skewer as well. Pour into the vessel of your choice and label. You will have a longer shelf life if you do add in essential oils and vitamin E. Now weeds. They're nutritious. We get exercise when we're out. Self-sufficiency-wise, you can't beat the free herbs that are in our environment. The pictures of these are, are Malva, which is top right, and this one's Malva neglecta. And then bottom left is nettles. Um, nettles we tend to do quite a bit with, everything from making pasta through to making infusions. And a weed is simply a, a plant that's out of place. You could have an oak tree that's a weed if you don't want it growing in a spot. The first herb we're going to start with um, going in depth is plantain, also known as white man's footprint. What I want you to notice with plantain is it's got these circular rosette leaves. And when you look at the veins in the leaves, they go all the way to the end. This picture on the right that's showing the, let's see, these guys, these strings. There is no other plant that you will pull apart that has those strings. So when you're looking at the herb, there we go, now I got rid of my drawings. When you're looking at, at this herb to pick, when you pick it, the strings will be at the base and you'll have usually a multitude of strings coming out. As you break the leaf off, you're gonna have strings in between. Now, one of the easiest poultices is that bottom left photo, simply where I have squished this up with my fingers. 
Um, if it's on you, you know, feel free to do a spit poultice, but if you're making this for somebody else, sometimes people are pretty hesitant for that. This is one of the best herbs when you are camping, when you're at a family picnic, when you are simply out walking. I have used this on everything from bee stings, um, mosquito bites, all the way through to blisters in my shoes, and it helps immensely. Plantago Major and Lancelotta are the two that we typically have around our area. So you will see these bigger round leaves in my pictures because that's predominantly what's in my yard. Lancelotta, though, has more lance-shaped leaves that, that come down and aren't quite as fat in the middle. However, when you pick it, you will still see the telltale strings and the veins will always go to the end. There's a couple things that we do with plantain that are simple in your kitchen. You can dry it for infusions. However, one of the things about infusions of plantain, great for GI issues, mouth issues, um, anti-inflammatory, but this one tastes pretty bitter, so I always make sure I put it with some other herb. For example, mints do very, very well with plantain. You can powder it for use on skin and then poultices. With poultices, at least in our environment, we have this plant in summer, but we don't have it in winter. If I want to save a poultice for winter, I will simply harvest these leaves. I will crush them up. I will put them in a muslin cloth. I put those in Ziploc bags and label them, and they go in my freezer. So that way, if I need a poultice of plantain or yarrow in the wintertime, they're very easy to just pull out of the freezer, thaw, and then use. Plantain oil also, absolutely fantastic salve. Um, so I would encourage you to make both. Now my plantain leaves, plantain is um, fairly mucilaginous. It does contain a significant amount of water, so I do let these tend to dry for a day or two and wilt them prior to putting them in oil. We're gonna get to calendula for mosquito bites. That's my favorite. Second weed we're going to talk about is chickweed. Um, I hope most of you have eaten chickweed. If you have not, it is one of the best kept secrets out there. Most people think of chickweed and they pull it out. Um, where it got its name from is chickens absolutely love this plant, but it's one of our best greens. Also, chickweed, at least for me in Wisconsin, is always coming up except for in the middle of winter time. However, my raised beds I do cover, and I left a cake um, covering out one year, and I had fresh chickweed that was underneath there for all but a month. So if you make your own greenhouse, chickweed is amazingly resilient. Right now it doesn't like our summertime because it gets too dry. It definitely likes moist lower areas. One of the things with chickweed is it's got five petals to its bloom, but as you're looking at this, you're going to think there's ten. Um, they are bifurcated in the middle, almost all the way down. So when you're looking at blooms, look for let's see these pods. Oops, where's my drawing guy? There we go. You can see these pods coming starting. The leaves are always opposite on this plant, and then also you can ever see so slightly this line of hairs coming right through the stem. And then when you're looking at the bloom, you want to make sure you have those five petals, but they're going to look like 10. Eat it fresh. It is wonderful in salads, in smoothies. Um, there's probably a day that does not go by when I can harvest this that is not in some type of food I'm making. I make pesto out of it. Um, I make cooked greens. There's very few things I think of that chickweed can't go into. Now, drying issues with chickweed. Chickweed is a very, very succulent plant. Um, so speaking of which, this is one of the few that I do not do a cold infusion of oil for chickweed. I do do a warm infusion of oil and a double boiler with chickweed. It is an oil that I've also had go bad due to water content. Problem with chickweed doesn't dry all that well and keep all that well. So doing a fresh warm infusion um, works nicely. If you don't have a double boiler, I would suggest you get one. My favorite is my 1921 Pyrex that I can completely see through. Um, I also have a friend who does it in a chocolate pot that her top um, vessel is porcelain. 
But you definitely want to invest in double boiler for salves and then also for warm infusions of oils. One of the things chickweed's known the best for is it's high in saponins, which have been um, implicated in weight loss. I would surmise that people are just eating good, healthy food, and we should get them out of prepackaged foods. Yarrow, Achilla millifolia. This is soldier's herb or staunch weed. Yarrow is another one that is ubiquitous everywhere. I don't think I've been anywhere where I have not run into a yarrow plant. When you're looking at yarrow, it stands about a foot, foot and a half tall here in Green Bay. I have seen it much shorter, six to seven inches in the desert, and I've seen it taller where it's in a moister environment. Ferny leaves is the biggest thing that you look for on here. Villifolia, think of the, the hundred, hundred little leaves. Let's see if I can get my pen, there we go. Um, all of these within that leaf, little teeny ferny foliage. And then when you're looking at the blooms, you really want to stick to the non-hybrid true yarrow. Now, yarrow can be used several different ways. As an infusion, it is fantastic for colds, flus, fevers. Also, once you make your infusion, it's an excellent topical wash for skin. I tend to tincture yarrow. I travel a lot, and I find traveling with tinctures to be very easy to do. Um, also, with tinctures, if you need it, you need it right away. You don't have to stop to make an infusion. I make oil with yarrow, and then I also make salves with yarrow. Yarrow is another one that's an easy spit poultice to use. It is known for staunching bleeding. Speaking of which, yarrow infusion and yarrow tincture have been known to help especially perimenopausal women or women with heavy bleeding. And then one of my favorite ways of yarrow is beer. It, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Bruner's book on herbal and medicinal healing beers, but back in the old monk times, um, herbs were preserved in alcohol form because they could be utilized all year round. And medicinal beers um, were I just can't say enough about them. If you have ever thought about brewing your own beer, do it. Um, and I would do yarrow, I would do elderberry, um, and then the other one I like is lemon balm. But actions of yarrow, um, antipyretic, it helps fevers come down, it helps people sweat out fevers. But then one of the biggest things it's known for with its wound healing ability is its astringency. Pot marigold, Calendula officinalis, and this is one of the most happy herbs. It is an annual, and this is another one that grows almost anywhere. I purposely picked plants that you can grow in your own yard, you can grow in a pot, you can grow on a balcony, you can grow these anywhere, and they're simple and easy to utilize. This was originally brought over by the settlers. Do not mess this one up with French marigold, speaking of which, which is tangetes. It doesn't taste the same, does not have the same medicinal properties, and is nowhere near the same. These are flowers that I am wilting on top of a cookie rack, and this cookie rack is sitting on a laundry rack in my back hall where it gets plenty of airflow through. I wilt these down for a couple of days and then make tinctures or make oils out of them and then also completely dry them to go on for teas. Calendula has got a lot of great properties, um, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial. It is excellent for coughs, colds, and flus. It's another one that dried, used in infusions. So think of it not only for teas and taking orally, but it's an excellent wound wash, also a great compress, um, and poultices as well. Healing to the GI tract, so everything from skin issues through to inflammatory bowel issues. This tincture is one of my favorites for insect bites. Um, one of my little goddaughters, who's 10 now, she knows to go for the calendula oil or the calendula tincture every time she has mosquito bites. And she travels a lot as well, and she has a half ounce dropper bottle of her calendula tincture, and um, she, that even goes camping with her. So um, tinctures can also be utilized in different ways, not just orally. You can dilute down a tincture for a wound or a skin wash. You can also dilute down tincture for compresses. With salves, 
fantastic for anything that's an inflammatory skin condition. Also, calendula, use it in foods. I stick it, stick it in soups and stews. Historically, its leaves were used for making the yellow dye in cheeses, butters. Um, I've also used these in cheesecakes. And then I am a big one for getting children eating salads and eating fresh greens. And how I can usually do this is by making a very colorful salad. And calendula petals are a large part of getting that orange color in there. And when you're thinking about other colors in salads, um, Monardo works very well. The Didyma as well as the fistulosa for red and purple coming into your salads. The last herb that we're going to finish up on is sage. Um, most people think of sage, and this is a simple common garden sage. It's salvia officinalis. It is the one that you use in stuffing for turkey for Thanksgiving, but it also has numerous, numerous other uses. Two, if people aren't growing things, um, have a hard time finding things, Sage you can simply find at the grocery store. Although I would caution you when we're trying to use medicinal herbs, I've been stuck using grocery store sage before. It's not near as powerful as what you can get at your local herb shop or what you can grow in your yard. Um, also, it's harder to know how long it's been sitting there, how it's been processed. Um, but sage infusions, um, hot infusions for coughs, colds, flus, um, cold infusion for helping decrease hot flashes and sweating. Sage has been known for a very long time to help people with excessive sweating. And then perimenopausal women and menopausal women with hot flashes, a cold sage infusion prior to bed. Sage, again, after you make your infusion, can be used as compresses, can also be used as a skin wash, makes a fantastic mouthwash and gargle. Um, sore throats, a sage gargle four or five times a day will help take away the pain as well as resolve the sore throat. I also use it as a mouthwash for anybody undergoing any type of dental care, gingivitis, um, any work done on their gums, sage mouthwash is excellent. You can mix other things in with it or just use plain sage infusion. Again, remember when you're making these, three days in the fridge, so it's not like you have to make it every day. Sage honeys are excellent. If you have never fooled around with medicinal honeys or maple syrups, I would tell you to please do so. It will open up a whole other experience on how you can use your herbs. Um, sage honey, rosemary honey, if we're sticking to common kitchen herbs, um, and then monarda honey are three of my favorites. So high antioxidant effect. And when you look at most of these herbs that were used historically for, for preserving meat, they're all high in antioxidant content. Now, where to find your herbs? Not all of us are fortunate enough to grow our own. Um, so pots do really well, but your local health food store I found to be invaluable, and I have found them wherever I've been able to travel to. It usually have very knowledgeable people, but please inquire regarding the herbs, how long they've been there, um, what the, the shelf life is of them, how they've been stored. And then some of my favorite ways of obtaining the herbs is woodland foraging and urban foraging. Um, you can find these herbs in cities as well as woodlands. Go with as many local herbalists and foragers as you can because the more environments you can recognize these herbs in, the better they will serve you. I found them in yards. Um, and then Washington, D.C., Central Mall. It is amazing how many herbs you can find. The picture on your right is elderberry, actually elderflower at this stage. Elderberry is another one that is a fantastic herb to use that you can find everywhere. And these little elder flowers make the best beer and also um, infusions for coughs, colds, and flus. I wanted to give you what I consider some of the cornerstone books that if you, as you start doing these things in your kitchen to make things easy. Herbal Medicine Chest by Rosemary Gladstar is an easy read, fantastic book. Um, Throne a Low Dog's Healthy at Home that just came out this year. Um, more medicinally focused, but everything in there you can make in your kitchen. Practical Herbalism by Philip Fritchie, and then A City Herbal by Maida Silverman, um, especially for people who live in the cities. Um, when I've been leading herb walks in, in cities, I pull this book out all the time because I get people who say, well, what possible herbs could we find? It's amazing what you can find in the concrete anywhere. 
Um, Forager's Harvest by Sam Thayer and Nature's Garden by Sam Thayer. If you ever have an opportunity to take a class with him, absolutely fantastic. Speaking with any of these people, get in their classes. But then, too, wherever you are at your locale, get into every herb walk you can, um, every class you can making these things. It's one thing to learn out of a book, which is fine, and, and most people do okay. But I tell you, by watching people, you learn their tricks. I go to as many different herbal classes as I can get into with as many different teachers. Everybody's got their own philosophy, their own tricks as they're making things that can help make your life a whole lot easier. That's our content for today. I'd love to open up to questions. Speaking of which, this is my, my messy raspberry patch. And raspberry leaves can even be used for infusions and are great astringent infusions for things like diarrhea and um, bleeding. So you can take very common plants and use them in a multitude of ways, not just the fruit. Lynn, thank you so much. I learned so much in this presentation, and your pictures were just gorgeous. Well, thank you. And um, I invite people to my garden all the time. <laughs> Well, we've got a lot of folks that have queued up to ask questions, so let's get started. Um, do you know why certain roots such as marshmallow, cherry bark, and valerian are best for cold infusion? It, all of those are high in tannins if with hot infusions. Things like marshmallow root that are highly mucilaginous, um, long cold infusions tend to do better with the proteins. Um, cherry bark is another one with cold infusion. And then valerian. If you have ever tasted valerian all on its own in an infusion, um, it is not a very good tasting plant. It, it, that's an interesting one. My mother heard me give a talk on sleep herbs one time, and I evidently did not do a very good job of explaining valerian in an infusion because she went home, she made her valerian infusion, immediately called me and gave me feedback like only your mother or sisters can about how bad it tasted, uncensored. Um, when you're doing valerian as a cold infusion, I would mix this with something else. Um, I tend to mix it with fairly strong mints, um, especially lemon balm. Lemon balm's a great calming nerve for evening, and that's another one also that I prefer is cold infusion versus hot infusion. Um, so that's my only caution with valerian is make sure you're mixing it with some other herb that does a good cold infusion as well. Um, but hot, long infusions bring out more tannins, and they just typically don't taste as well. And also the proteins um, with hot infusions sometimes don't act well. The other one with cold infusion that I always like to bring up is staghorn sumac. It great, makes a great cold infusion. Um, the people who have tasted staghorn sumac who tell me it tastes better, I know immediately they've put hot water on it. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Um, also... We have another question. Uh, people ask about the uh, press you used for pressing herbs, and that was called a potato ricer, correct? Correct. It, I'll put um, the herb, I pour everything off through a sieve, and then whatever herb is left in my sieve, it, I let whatever oil or, or alcohol menstruum tincture drip out of that. And then I take what's left and I put it in the potato ricer and squeeze it. It is absolutely amazing how much more oil and tincture you're going to get out of your herb that way. Now, there's a few things that I caution people about. Elderberry is one of them that if you squish it, complicated term that, sorry. Um, if you press it, squish it way too hard, you end up getting the green out of the center. However, things that are leaves, typically do very well in a potato ricer, but, but yes, it's just a simple potato ricer. Make sure you get a stainless steel one, though. Excellent. Um, are the petals and flowers of chickweed edible as well? Yes, the whole plant. It is one of my favorite plants for trail food and then also just out in the garden. Um, when it starts getting leggy, sometimes the stems can get kind of stringy, and then I'll pull the leaves off. But when it's young and very tender, I just chop up the whole plant and put in salads. Um, but then, too, I'll just take the whole plant and just eat in the garden. When you're making things out of honey, do you wilt the leaves a little bit before you add to the honey, or do you add them to the honey fresh? It depends what it is. Again, if it's something with a high moisture content, I tend to wilt those just because we spend a long time collecting herbs and making preparations, and I don't want them to go bad. Um, so typically, if it's something with a higher water content, 
um, I will wilt them first. Um, the Monarda fistulosa that I just made yesterday, though, not such a high water content, and that I put straight into my honey. Um, when you use olive oil as a base, are you particular about it? So this question is, is it better to use extra virgin olive oil or just any old olive oil? It depends how you want it to smell. It, um, extra virgin olive oil tends to have that olive aroma to it that some people either love or hate. So sometimes I'll use a light olive oil if I don't want that smell at all, or I'll use just a different oil. If I'm looking for something heavier, for example, mullein flowers in olive oil for ears, I'll typically use extra virgin for that. Um, this is a, a very interesting question, especially given the horrible headlines that have been in the news about Ebola in Africa. And this is, uh, what are your thoughts about elderberry and elder leaves and the recent Ebola issue? I think they're asking about immunity and would that be useful or I know that you've done a lot of research on um, health in the different continents and the different things that people are exposed to. Um, I would think that there's probably many things to do to boost immune system function, but the best thing to do deal with the Ebola issue is to stay as far away from it as possible. Definitely avoidance at all costs. Um, I am not an expert in Ebola and elderberry. I, as much as I've read on elderberry and done with elderberry, I have never used it for a hemorrhagic virus before. So intriguing question, but not one that I know the answer to. Probably something we need a lot more research on because there are some amazing and unique antiviral compounds that we find in plants that we don't find in medicines. Definitely. Now, elderberry for coughs, colds, flus, any other viral issue, um, elderberry is just excellent nutritionally anyway. Wintertime here in Wisconsin, it goes in almost any baked good that I make. I've been even known to throw a handful in soups, and then certainly goes in any infusion. Um, are you familiar with Tusilago farfara? And if you do, what is the best way to prepare and use it? I know it's very medicinal and not native to North America, but I found it in my yard. That is one I am not familiar with. <laughs> we are getting great questions today. Yes, we are. You know, sometimes you learn from the questions. Um, yes. And so it, since it's not native to America, it might be um, a more uh, a less common herb. Uh, do you know if yellow yarrow is a different variety from the yarrow about which you spoke? It is. Yellow is a hybrid. Um, that is not one I would use. I would stick to the medicinal yarrow. And you can find those um, at most nurseries now, but then also if you've got friends that do herbs, um, the Echillomillifolia without the hybridization should be fairly wide, widely available in most areas. Mm -hmm. um, is sage the same as clary sage, like the oil? No, nope, slightly different. Um, clary sage actually is another fantastic um, salvia plant. It, however, does not have the same properties as Salvia officinalis, which is the, the typical garden sage that we use. Um, when you look at, when you're preparing things with honey, this, this person asked about when you put the sage in the honey again, you're just putting the sage leaves into the honey and allowing it to sit? Correct. Um, I simply chop up the sage, and sage is not one I will before I put it in honey. I put it in the honey and I tend to, most of these things will rise to the top in honey and also in maple syrup. Um, I flip my jars a couple times a day if I'm able to so they disperse throughout. But simply chop it up, place it in your honey, cap it off, and then just keep a close eye on it. Uh, what are your concerns about toxins and pesticides when you are doing city harvesting? It, I tend to stay away from anywhere that I know there are toxins and pesticides. One of the nice things, most municipalities I find now are not spraying their fields. Two, if you have any questions regarding pesticides or herbicides around any plant, I would not harvest them at all. Um, I'm very lucky on my half acre, nobody uses anything even anywhere near around me and we've been on our half acre since 1998 and there have been no chemicals used, actually organic or otherwise, we just don't use any. Um, so, yeah, be very careful where you're harvesting your herbs, especially if you're on municipal land. If things are looking way too uniform, typically that's when we see we have a problem with chemical contamination. Another thing is ditches along roads. 
I'm careful with those. Um, also, anything that's close to a farmer's field, unless it's an organic farm that I know about, at least around Around here, you find a lot of Roundup Ready crops, so I tend to stay away from those. Um, forests, you're pretty safe in. Just please know the rules to wherever you are harvesting. I find, though, you know, we've got several places that say no foraging, but what I'm looking for in some of them is simply nettle and garlic mustard. Um, garlic mustard being an invasive plant here, and then nettle, which most parks really don't want because it tends to sting people who don't know what what they're looking at. Um, so they're like, no, no, go take all that you want. So I encourage you, even if the park says no harvesting, if you're very well educated regarding your plant and if it's a plant they may not want, still talk to the park rangers. Um, also, some municipalities have laws against harvesting within their parks. So just know the laws and the places where you are. But if you even remotely think it's contaminated, I would err on the side of not using it. Also, when you're buying your herbs at your local health food store, um, ask about are they organic, where were they harvested, um, and how contaminants are tested. Great advice. Um, do you have a perspective on uh, using sesame seed oil instead of olive oil for infusions? Oh, lots of people love sesame seed oil. I would tell you, full with all the different oils. Um, sesame is very nurturing to skin. Um, it does well, and uh, you infuse it just like you would any other oil. Um, here's a question about a specific application for herbs. Uh, this person wants to know what they can use instead of Metamucil. So what I'm thinking is that they probably are looking for some relief of constipation or hard stools. It, it's funny, Metamucil psyllium comes from a Plantago species. Um, when you're looking in your environment, plantain or the white man's footprint, plantago species, they are everywhere. The seeds on top, actually, I think my last slide, no, it went away. Um, we had a picture of some, there we go. It, um, see, Jennifer knows where it is. <laughs> it, this is the seed head to the plantain. And all of those can be harvested. Let them dry and simply shake them off the, the stalk itself. High fiber, high mucilage, um, and can be used in a variety of baked goods, can be used for infusions. Um, but then, too, when we're looking at constipation is how much fluid intake, how much exercise. Exercise works very well for constipation. Um, and then look at fiber intake of the plants that you're eating. Um, I'm a big advocate of smoothies because they still contain the fiber content. Um, and if you're really looking for, for fiber in those, um, look towards fruits. And actually a lot of berries that are coming off right now in our environment are high in fiber also. Well, since we're on the topic of home garden interventions for specific problems, here's another problem. Uh, do, you, do you have a recommendation for a good herbal remedy for scalp dermatitis, itchy scalp? Actually, plantain wash is fantastic for itchy scalp. Um, three herbs that I think of for itchy, um, plantain, calendula, and then also chamomile is a highly anti-inflammatory herb. All three of those can be used topically. Sometimes with itchy scalp, we've, we've got to get down to what's causing it, though. Um, is it an oil issue? Is it a yeast issue? Because sometimes that can cause itchy scalp. So once you, you get through through those, make sure people are, are well nourished. They've got enough water intake. They've got enough oils intake. I'm not sure we're doing ourselves a great service by these low, low-fat diets people are utilizing. So that's one thing I always ask about when I have a hot, itchy skin issue. And then if there's no pathogens, for example, yeast, I would use those three herbs as a wash, and I would use them after people shampoo. Um, also, another thing for itchy scalp um, is vinegar. Vinegar washes can be highly soothing to skin. Excellent. Um, and, uh, we've got a lot of questions that want us to repeat specific recipes or go into more detail about how to create. So, um, And others that have asked, what book would you recommend as something of a recipe how-to book? You've recommended this group of books that we happen to be on that slide. Uh, but of these that you're recommending, is there one that stands out for just a basic beginner's recipe book? Let's get started and let's do this. 
basic beginners herbal medicine chest by Rosemary Gladstar. However, I, I know a lot of people we're talking to have a healthcare background, and healthy at home is fantastic. So those would be my go-tos. If people do not have a medicinal background at all, I, I would go to herbal medicine chest. Somewhat of a med, uh, medical background or medical background, I would go to healthy at home. Both of those books have fantastic recipes that are easy to make and well explained. Um, in addition to the books, though, I would also get into a class with an herbalist, and I would get into several. Each herbalist has their own tricks on how they do things, and sometimes you have that aha moment watching somebody about, oh, that's what makes that easier. Wonderful. Um, here's a, a question about when to use plastic lids or ever and when to use metal lids. It, I tend to use the metal lids inside the plastic lids all the time except for doing vinegars. When I'm doing vinegars, I'll put saran wrap over the top and then put the plastic lids on. The reason I do that is because those plastic lids, I don't know how many people have used them, but they certainly don't seal. So learn that several different ways with things leaking because a lot of times I'm spinning things up on their lids and I want those to seal completely. So if I use the canning lids, on top of them, they tend to seal much better. So I can either shake them or, for example, with the honeys where things tend to go to the bottom, I tend to flip those jars more than just shake. I'll shake and then flip them. Hmm. Are there any herbs that are useful for men over the age of 45 who wish to increase their healthy testosterone levels? Biggest problem we find with decreasing testosterone levels is increasing BMI. Um, when I'm starting to work with people on decreasing testosterone, who have decreased testosterone levels, that is one of the first things we look at. And then getting them back, just nourishing them and getting them to an adequate BMI. I tend not to use herbs heroically with regards to that. Most of the time, if we can address their underlying health, we can get that fairly under control. All right. So by addressing some of the other things that interfere with proper testosterone levels, you can start to bring them back up with um, indirect intervention. Correct. All right. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Glancing through what we've already mm -hmm. uh There's also um, an excellent recommendation. You talked about grating beeswax, and that once you use the grater for the beeswax, that's that. That's will now. From now and ever forward, be your designated grater. <laughs> they said that they learned from a beekeeper that instead of grating, put a big bar of the beeswax in the freezer for a few days. Take it out and whack it with a hammer, and it will shred into tiny little bits, and it works fantastically. Oh, I love that tip. See, those are the things you learn. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Um do you have any medicinal applications for beets and beet greens? Oh, beets, yes. Beets high, high in anthocyanins, antioxidants, nitric oxide production. Um, we can even treat things like hypertension with beets. Um, beet greens can go in soup, salads, anything. Um, beets I'm a huge fan of. And actually, we just made baby food for a friend's baby out of the beet green tops and then beets as well. So um, medicinal applications for beets, I've never utilized them that way. I've used them more as a nutritive food. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we also have a question here about, you talked about a topical use for St. John's wort. Yes. Um, and, and, and how do you use St. John's wort? What would you use it for topically? I think many of us are probably familiar with the antidepressant effects of using St. John's wort as an extraction. But how do you use it topically? Oh, St. John's wort. I tend to make oil out of it. I use oil straight on skin for any hot inflammatory conditions. It works very, very well for nerve pain. So shingles, um, HSV outbreaks as in cold sores, works really well for those, um, especially for shingles. I've gotten such good results for th with that. Also topically for burns and, for example, sunburn. St. John's wort will help that immensely. If you want to take the initial sting away, you can use a tannin wash, but then I use the St. John's wort oil on it after that. And very, very healing and nurturing to skin. So anything that you think of as a hot inflammatory condition, 
St. John's wort oil can help. I've also made St. John's wort oil into stav and use it as one of the oils in my stav recipes and works well there also. But sunburn, shingles, and um, cold sores, top three things I think of St. John's wort oil for. And I tend to make it in grapeseed. And here's why. It's got that great delicate red color. I just want it in an oil that's not going to interfere with that at all. So I tend to make it in my lighter oils. Also, when I use that as oil straight on skin, is I want it to absorb very well. So I, that's why I tend to go to grapeseed or to almond for that one. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of comments on the side about recommendations because there are a lot of folks here that are knowledgeable about herbs for many of the things that mm -hmm. Uh, for which people have asked questions, so I would encourage you all to check your um, chat box to look at some of these wonderful recommendations. I would also, somebody wanted to make sure that we mentioned another book by Rosemary Gladstar about herbs for women. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, actually all of Rosemary Gladstar's books are fantastic. And she has a much um, thicker volume of herbal medicine chests to um, that once people start making things that they can branch out into. She's also got wonderful books on herbs and kids. Mm -hmm. Well, here, Lynn, this is a great compliment to you. Uh, that, that says, can we please do another webinar with Lynn in your kitchen showing us how to prepare and use some of the herbs in their own kitchen how to incorporate them into salads, smoothies, and into their meals. It would be a great opportunity to see you in action. We'll have to figure out the technology challenges for that <laughs> one, but I am way open to that it, because I really feel that how people start incorporating the, these things is by seeing and doing. The other thing I'm passionate about once you start this is feeding people because if you can taste them. So, so hopefully we'll have a webinar in my kitchen, and I can at least show you how I do a few of these things. You know, this is a level of how much I trust you. Um, and I'm sharing this with all of our folks. Uh, when I have visited Lynn's garden, I've been fortunate enough to do so on a couple of occasions. One of the first things she ends up saying is, here, try this. Put this in your mouth. And I never, with any doubt or any question whatsoever, pop it immediately into my mouth. And she'll say, taste that. And nine times out of ten, it's a very interesting experience. One time out of ten, it's a, it's a noteworthy experience. <laughs> All right, here's a question about any herbs you know of that help with vitamin D absorption. Well, you don't actually absorb vitamin D in the, from the sun, but what they mean is the vitamin D metabolism within the body after exposure to sunshine. This is an area where they really uh, struggle, even though they're outside every day. I am not aware of any herb that helps that. When I think of vitamin D in foods, I always go to mushrooms, which have a high, high vitamin D content. Um, I would love to be able to solve the problem of vitamin D absorption um, because I, too, have run into individuals that we have on high, high doses of vitamin D, and they are out in the sun, and we're still not getting the absorption that we should see. So if anybody's got an answer to that one, please throw it up in the chat room, but I apologize, I do not. You know, um, one thing to consider, and this may sound a little wacky, but um, what a lot of people don't understand, and I'm not sure what country this lady is located in, but cholesterol-lowering medications are uh, mm -hmm. probably, when you combine the different types, are probably the best-selling drug in America. And, and so I, I don't even know what the statistics are, but it seems to me like one out of every three or four people I meet is on a cholesterol-lowering medication. And what people don't realize is that cholesterol is needed by the body to make vitamin D. The, the sunshine is the trigger. Uh, in the melanocytes in the skin, but it's cholesterol that's one of the building blocks that creates vitamin D. And so if people are struggling, what, I'm not saying that this is this lady's particular cause, but if they're doing all the right things and they're still struggling with vitamin D, um, I would ask their doctor to review what medications there are, if they are on and is there any way that those might be interfering with proper vitamin D creation inside the body. Um, here's a question about herbs for hypothyroidism. Do you have any thoughts on that, Lynn? Oh, herbs for hypothyroidism. Um, one of the things we want to make sure is that the thyroid is very well nourished. So typically herbs for hypothyroid, we start thinking of herbs with high iodine content. So more going towards seaweeds. Um, people who live in the Pacific Northwest have great access to those. Um, so most of the time with thyroid nourishing herbs, that's where we had. Awesome. Um, another uh, 
participant who is recommending the Green Pharmacy by Dr. James Duke. Yes. I am such a Dr. James Duke fangirl. He is just an amazing, eccentric, brilliant, entertaining gentleman, and he's in his 80s now, and he's just vibrant. Yes, it, that is a fantastic book. All right. Um, let's see if I'm – sorry, if I'm having a few pauses, but there's a lot of questions in here, and some of them are – Repeat, I want to make sure I don't ask the same thing twice. Um, do you have any suggestions for peripheral neuropathy? St. John's wort. That one I would do as an infusion, and I would do that internally, or I would do it as a supplement. Um, but St. John's wort for neuropathy has been absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. All right. I would also consider oat straw there. Oat straw is another one very nourishing to the nervous system, and you can do the two of them together without any issue. Excellent. All right. I think I'm just glancing through to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, I think we've gotten through all of our questions. So, Lynn, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for taking time out of your very busy day. And, it's you know, Green Bay, Wisconsin has about 10 really awesome weather days a year where it's neither too hot nor too cold, and it's not raining and it's not snowing, and this is one of them. So thank you for being inside with us instead of outside in your garden. It has just been delightful. Well, thank you. I love sharing plants with people. We love that you love it. Um, and I hope you'll come back soon, and we are going to figure out how to do one of showing you in action in your kitchen. Um, I do want to take a moment before we close, folks, to talk about a wonderful webinar that's coming up in just about a week. Uh, August 8th with Dr. Ajay Gol, who is the head of epigenetic and cancer research at Baylor University and Baylor University Cancer Treatment Center. Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum, world-renowned pain, chronic fatigue, and fibromyalgia expert, and myself, Cheryl Myers, integrative health nurse um, and dietary supplement expert. And we're going to be talking about uh, BCM95 curcumin. There have been the 16th study on this specific form has just recently been published. Uh, giving you more information about how that's been utilized in a wide variety of disorders. And we're also going to, on August 15th, do a webinar on jump-starting your thyroid. So for those of you who have a lot of interest in different ways to help your thyroid uh, be healthier, I hope that you'll take the time to join us. Um, for more information, feel free to visit us at Terry Talks Nutrition. Uh, you can sign up for a free weekly newsletter. We greatly respect your email address. We never share it, and we never sell it. So if you are interested in learning more, um, we'd be glad to send you a newsletter each week. Uh, you can go to this website to listen to recordings of past seminars. So if you would like to review this again or if you have a friend that you'd like to recommend it to, we hope you'll come back and watch the webinar again um, in our list of past recordings. There's also a place there where you can ask Terry your specific questions. Uh, one of our questions was how to contact you, uh, how to contact Lynn Green. Um, and so I think that a good place to do that was is in the Terry Talks Nutrition website. Just ask Terry your questions. Just say you have a question for Lynn Green, um, and they will find her and make sure we get an answer to you. You can follow Terry on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Limerand. And we would be honored if you find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Terry Talks Nutrition. Thank you again, all of you. We appreciate uh, everything that you do to further the cause of using plants in a medicinal manner. Uh, and until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.